crazy, bro. And she whacked him in the side and screaming in the neighborhood. Like, yeah. 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 Can you believe that? Because we were talking about these boys who wear their pants so low. I was just going to say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have to come down here. We're talking about, about, about the money. We're talking about all the money they spend on blue jeans and all the holes in them. I said, yeah, I'll be good. That's right. Buy some shit. I'll be good. Hey, me to do it for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you guys get back to girl talk. Oh, that's all we're talking about. Yeah. Just wasn't girl talk. Just it wasn't girl talk. Yeah, that was. Lunch.
morning rounds. Are you concerned? <laughs> When we long for the special effects we think life should offer, it is enough for us to take out our shelves. When our hearts are cracked by the drought of death, it is enough for us to take out our shelves. When our senses are deadened by the sales pitches of our culture, it is enough for us to take out our shelves. Well, good morning, one and all. Thank you for being here. I'm going to have my wife continue to stand because the first song we're going to do today has a very important significance. 
certificates for things coming up in the future. So first of all, we say welcome to all of you for those who are in person or those who are online. We are thankful you're with us today. If this is your first time with us, please feel free. If the people before you to drop the information, drop it in the box so we can get to know you. And as always, downstairs after the service, we have a time for fellowship with donuts and coffee. So, EBS is coming up today. Not today, but July. So with that, we're going to do some exercises. Give it in your morning exercises today. We're going to do some morning exercises with the chorus, some of the signs of the songs. One of the songs that is going to be sung during PBS is House of the Lord. So on the chorus, I'm going to have you do your best to play along. So we'll say, uh, in the chorus, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Let's try that again. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. One more time. You're doing great. Three times. Pump in the hand. Woo! There's joy <laughs> in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out and praise. No quiz. Do something wrong. No judgment. We're here just to have a good time and work together. So here we go. You may do one more part. And then here's a person. Um, so God. Our God is surely in this place. Gotcha. All right. Let's try it. See if you can sing and do the actions all at the same time. <laughs> Father Abraham, remember that? Okay.
deserve a hand. Thank you for your Good sport. Appreciate that. We're going to move now to Jesus Paid It All. The words will be on the screen, or you can feel free to look at your hymnals 305. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. Jesus Paid It All, 305, are on the screen. It's, 
so be sure. Oh, Harry's doing it. He's getting, Harry's putting it in his phone right now. Good job. So uh, those here, those at home, those are the supplies we need. Uh, you can bring them um, on the Sunday or even during the week. Um, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, Grant's here. And I'm here Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday during the week or on Saturdays. Um, so be sure to drop them off then. Thank you. Any other announcements? We good? Okay. One of the important parts of our uh, worship on Sundays is prayer. Uh, we believe prayer uh, impacts us personally and those around us. It actually is putting uh, God's plan into motion and changing us in the midst of what God is doing in our midst. And so we do that. We ask for prayer requests for people that are here or people that are at home. If you're at home and you have a prayer request, uh, maybe this is the first time you're tuning in. We'd love to hear your prayer requests. You can just type it in the comments. Eric will be sure to raise his hand and wave me down and we'll make sure we hear that. But we'd love to be able to lift each other's prayer concerns and, and praises, things that God is doing in our midst um, and we'd love to share those and, and lift those up together. So, does anyone have a prayer request or praise this morning? Jamie. My older brother's having hip replacement surgery on Wednesday morning. Jamie's brother? His name is Kirk. K I R K. Brother Kirk is having hip replacement surgery this Wednesday. So, just pray that that goes well and for a quick and uh, healthy recovery. Sherry. Uh,
us in our prayers as well. Okay. Well, let's take these uh, prayer uh, prayers and praises uh, to the Lord this morning. Father, we uh, we're thankful that you have called us as your people. Father, we have so much uh, going on um, in our lives. Our lives are so hectic. It is good to be together in the house of the Lord today. Father, we uh, we just thank you that whatever we have, whatever anxieties we have, whatever concerns we have, Father, we can bring them to you personally at any time, but also we can bring them uh, to you in the midst of our assembly so others can be aware of what's struggling, uh, what struggles we have in our lives, and that they can also encourage us and lift those up as well. And so, Father, we pray uh, for those that are traveling this week, that are not able to join us in person, but are on the road enjoying summer. Father, we pray that uh, those that are going on mission trips, Father, that you would help uh, give them peace, give them discernment, and give them strength and perseverance. Father, we also, uh, we, we lift up Jamie's brother, Kirk, Pray for his hip surgery, Father, that it goes uh, well. Father, we also pray for uh, the recovery as well, Father, uh, strengthening that hip uh, in the weeks to come. Father, we also pray for Gus. Father, we're so thankful for, for who he is and what he's meant to our uh, church congregation. Uh, Father, we just pray that you continue to strengthen him and give him perseverance. Father, we pray for, for the staff of Friendship Village that are caring for so many. Father, we pray for... Uh, wisdom, discernment, and um, empathy and compassion uh, for them as they continue to care for so many of our friends and loved ones. Father, we also we lift up um, James and Dorcas. Father, we're thankful uh, that they were able to celebrate uh, a life well lived in Dorcas's mom, and we just pray uh, that the family is able to continue to grieve and to celebrate her life in the coming week. We pray for them to get home safely. Father, we also uh, we pray for Mark Osling. Father, uh, cancer is such a horrible enemy, and Father, uh, it takes so much from us. And so, Father, we just pray for Mark and his family and friends. Father, that you be able to come alongside them and give them hope, and uh, we pray for Mark for strength and perseverance. And uh, Father, we're just thankful that uh, you, have, you, you have given him good friends to pray for him and to encourage him on uh, this journey that he is on. Father, we also lift up BBS. Father, we pray that you would uh, just do a mighty work, not only in the kids that you draw here, we pray that you would bring many kids here to hear the gospel, uh, to have fun, and to know that you love them and care for them, but also, Father, in those uh, that are volunteering. Father, that, that as we volunteer, as we serve, Father, it changes us. So I, I pray that we have joy uh, in uh, helping <laughs> minister to these kids, but also as we tell stories and have shared experiences. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn more of the gospel and experience the gospel uh, as we are serving and, and, and helping these kids to know you during the week of BBS and preparing up to the week of BBS. Uh, Father, we're just thankful that, that, that we are able to host, and Father, I pray an impact will be felt in our community. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Finally, one of the other things that we have been doing this year is we've been reciting the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is a early creed of the church, and it helps declare what we believe not only about God, the Father, but uh, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it'll be on our screens, so I encourage you in person or even at home to, to recite it out loud, to help us to understand it, to memorize it. And so if you would, just read along with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he goes to living in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the one holy universal Christian church. Saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. As a reward, since you did the calisthenic and singing at the same time, continue to stay seated through these next two songs, but please continue to sing. We're going to do next the solid rock. It will be on the screen, so feel free to turn your hands to 526.
We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth stanza, Solid Rock, on the screens for 526. <laughs> Paul 
has from his church in Philippi who has cared for him and blessed him uh, during his ministry. And so, but ultimately today, and we'll hit this in just a moment, but today it's about contentment. And for some of us, we struggle with being content with where we are, where God has us. And so I'm hoping that today you'll find some peace, some direction. But in the book of Philippians, just for those who couldn't be with us, uh, it had a lot of good messages for us. It talked about, in chapter 1, about the hope in difficult circumstances. That we're supposed to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. In chapter 2, we, we talked about, and Pastor Baker gave me the hard time about working out y'all's salvation. That, that you is plural. That oftentimes, whenever we read through that, we think that it's a works righteousness and that I need to work out my salvation, my sanctification on my own. That that should be on my daily to-do list. But really what Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi to do is to check on each other and help each other grow in the Lord. So if they're struggling, encourage them. To ask how you can pray for them, for each other. How they are growing in God's word. That's all part of working out our salvation, sanctifying us, and helping us to become more like Jesus every day. Because if our church is filled with Jesus's, this will be the place to be. We also, in chapter 3, we talked about that we are, uh, Paul, Pastor Baker, uh, preached that we are not justified by our resume. That if anybody was going to stand on the merits of their resume, it would have been Paul. Because he was the Jew, Jew of Jews, he said. And he went through his resume that he was uh, circumcised on the eighth day. So even at the beginning, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin. That he was a Pharisee in training. That he was climbing that religious ladder. And if anybody could be justified before God on their religious merits, it would have been Paul. But he reminded us that I don't count my past for anything. That he said, forget about the past, what God has done in the past. Don't rest on your laurels and move forward with the mission of proclaiming Jesus wherever you go. And last week, he instructed us to be at peace. Do not be anxious about anything. But in prayer and petition, we're presenting our request to God. And so for some of us, this was uh, an encouraging book, talking about being, rejoicing always, do not be anxious, and then again today, being content in all things. But for some of us, we're like, Pastor, I'm not buying it. I'm hardly ever joyous. I'm hardly ever not anxious. And I am definitely not content. And I recognize that. For some of us, we hear this, and we hear these promises, we hear these instructions by Paul, and you're like, I don't like it. I don't get it. God's not doing it in my life. And that can be hard. And so Paul, though, just like the church in Philippi, is reminding us and challenging us where we put our hope, where we find our contentment, where we have our anxiety. And so five words that I would say that help uh, summarize this book of only four chapters. By the way, if you haven't done your homework, if you haven't read the book of Philippians, I want to encourage you to do it. It's only four chapters. Takes about 15 minutes ish, is what they average. But the five words that would help summarize the book of Philippians unity. He wants the church to be unified, to have joy, to be known as a church of joy, of growth, of sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, to be a church of peace. That wherever you go, you have a peaceful demeanor, and people say, what is wrong with this guy? And finally, being a church that is content, 
no matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so that is the book of Philippians. And as we finish it up, next week, this is my, my, my teaser trailer. I know it's not very much of a teaser. There's not much action or explosions or whatnot in it. It is a summer blockbuster series, right? But we're going to be entering into the book of Nahum. How many of you have ever read the book of Nahum? Wow, good job. <laughs> all, all three or four of you. <laughs> and so here, it's even a book that I think, I think I read it in seminary. I have to be honest, sometimes your pastors don't always read everything they're assigned in seminary. I know we're supposed to be the most ethical ones, but it's kind of like every other, other uh, student in whatever other school. Yeah, I read it, Prof. And really, I skimmed it. But still, that was <laughs> years ago in seminary, and so I need to go back. And I'm looking forward. I've got four books that's going to help me delve in to the book of Nahum. We're going to learn about uh, the city that Jonah visited, Nineveh, and what happens. What happens. But today, we're finishing at Philippians. So we're in Philippians 4, verses 10 through 23. So if you would, follow along with me. Paul says this, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned that whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord in our reading this morning. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for your graciousness. Father, that you have called us to be a church family, that you are calling us to be unified, that you are calling us to have peace, that you are calling us to be content. Father, I pray that you would be with each of us, whether we're here in person or whether we're at home. Father, that you would stir in our hearts and souls this morning. Father, that your spirit would help us to hear what we need to hear and Father, that we would all be changed this morning. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to start at the, at the end here. Sorry, Sue, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. We're just going to start at verse 21, where it says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And my thoughts on this is that it's great to hear to be part of God's family, even whenever you're not with each other. Here Paul is just saying, everybody says hi. And he's even pointing out, as he is in jail, he is uh, being uh, imprisoned at home. But he still has an interaction with guards and Caesar's household. Crazy, right? But all of these believers are making sure those that are in Philippi know they are sending their greetings. They're all saying hello and that they're missed. And it's a good idea for us as we look at other believers at other churches to know that we are a family together even though we are not with them. And now we'll get to the beginning. Just a good note. So as we look at 
the beginning, <clears throat> the main emphasis that Paul is talking about is being content in all circumstances. And this is what he's been pre preparing us for this entire letter. About not being anxious about anything and everything rejoice. And now he's talking about being content in every situation. And a lot of his contentment, he is saying, uh, he's setting up with the generosity of the church of Philippi. That he loves them because they have cared so well for him throughout his ministry. And he begins that in verse 10 saying, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. And you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need. I don't know, Ralph, you may need to grade Paul on that because it was a little bit of a confusing sentence. And his English, at least his Greek, may have been okay. But it was a little confusing as I was reading about how their concern now has been revived. So is he saying they, they lost their concern for Paul? They forgot about Paul? Oh yeah, I'm sure he's fine and didn't care for him. No, but what they did have for him are these offerings. His gracious monthly support or his uh, missionary support finally arrived, right? We can't uh, Venmo uh, Paul uh, and his support, right? We can't use our cash apps. They didn't have Western Union, right? And so any gifts that the church in Philippi was giving to a missionary like Paul, they would have to have someone there that could go and take it to him. And that was the role of Epaphroditus in this story. We see him a couple times in the book at the beginning and here at the end. He was the messenger. He was bringing word, Paul was bringing word of himself and his imprisonment of, in Rome to the church in Philippi through Epaphroditus. And return Epaphroditus, after giving him the, the information and hanging out with the folks in Philippi, brought him back gifts. And these would have been support monetarily. Now, obviously, there would have been a chunk of time as Paul was off gallivanting, right, and setting up churches that he may not have received the church of Philippi. But what we read here is that they are the first church that supported him when no one else would. And so here what Paul is saying as he talks that he received full payment and more, that he received their burnt offerings, their fragrant offerings that smell great. I don't know if that's potpourri or candles or whatever that fragrant offering was, but it smelled great. <coughs> that he was well supplied, that they had blessed him beyond what he needed. And so we have a church that is so generous, that is blessing this missionary and his work. And so my encouragement as a pastor who receives this support from the church, as we support missionaries like the Kelgers, as we help nonprofits as part of our budget, all of this is uh, working to move the gospel forward. And here what Paul is recognizing is that the support that he receives isn't impacting the church at Philippi. It's helping Paul's ministry wherever he is. And as a pastor who receives support, it's practical because it helps put food on my family's table. It helps put clothes on their back and support over their head, shelter over their head. It's important. But also what Paul makes sure they understand, it's more important or more than just those things, it's the encouragement. You see me. You care about me. You're supporting the Lord's work in my life. And that encouragement, that emotional support is also important. That's why he's giving them credit that they were the only church that was helping him out. Because that support, that encouragement, that recognition is also important to our pastors and our missionaries. That they are seen that God has called them, and we support what God is doing in that area. That's why I believe that missions is relational, that we should have contact with those missionaries to know them, to know their families, so we can pray for them, and we know what's going on in their lives, because it makes it more personal, and I want to help them, right? Having the Kelgers who were raised in this church, and we know them, is a lot better than Joe Schmo. That it sounds great as they're ministering in Florida, 
or in Bolivia or whatever country. But when you know a person and you know their heart and you know their passion, it makes it easier to support and you want to know what's going on. Tell us what's happening in Mexico. We have other missionaries that we support uh, that are in Japan. It's Jared and Megan Henley, and we, I think we've had them here maybe. Um, and so, uh, but he and his family are concerned with how they're doing. How is their ministry going? How can I encourage them, right? And so that is what Paul is saying at the beginning of this letter. Is I, and that's why this is a letter of friendship, because he feels it so um, intimately because of how they cared for him. But that graciousness, that generosity is also tempered about that he has learned to be content in every situation. Now, in studying about this and nerding out on this a little bit, I found some information about the Stoics, about the philosophy that was presiding at the time there in the church at Philippi, and this Stoic philosophy uh, had an idea about contentment that, that we may understand, but is not implicit in the letter. And so this is helpful for us to understand what Paul is talking about here. But the Stoics regarding contentment, or this word, this Greek word for contentment, uh, Artu Archaea, uh, Artu Archaea, as the essence, the essence of all virtues. For them, contentment described the mindset of the person who had become independent of all things and all people. The Stoic line was, man should be sufficient unto himself for all things and able by the power of his will to resist the force of circumstances. The Stoic Seneca put it this way, the happy man is content with his present lot, no matter what it is, and is reconciled to his circumstances. The Stoic ideal was, I, yeah, excuse me, the Stoic ideal was a kind of self-contained superman who could rise above it all in, in independent self-sufficiency and serenity. I hear that a little bit in our culture today. That if it's going to be, it's up to me. That I need to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Right? You're a man, figure it out. But here what's different and what Paul is changing in the, uh, the philosophy of this time is that no, it's not up to you. Because Paul says, I'm not content in myself. Remember in chapter 3, he gave us his whole resume. All of his religious exploits. Did that bring contentment? No. He learned to be content in all circumstances because of his relationship with Jesus. It was not, I'm not content in all circumstances because I can do it all on my own. But he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so here, this is a message that we need to hear because contentment is kind of the antithesis of our message that we hear every day. You're not good enough. You can do it better. What are you doing? What are your weaknesses? How can we strengthen them? And so it's hard whenever I'm, I was trying to to wrestle with how to present contentment because contentment is a little bit on a spectrum, right? Sometimes with our, 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 our high schoolers, our college students, they can be too content at home. They're like, I'm good. I don't need to do anything. I can just stay here in mom and dad's basement. I get all the food I want. They do my laundry. It's a pretty great life. But on the other side, we can never have peace. We can never just enjoy the present because we're always striving for something else, something better, something more. Every day, whenever we turn on our TVs or our smartphones, we are getting inundated with ads. How life could be better, how life could be more convenient. Amber and I have been playing pickleball for those they're unaware it's the fastest growing sport in America. That's kind of a joke in every medium that I find. 
Uh, but we were talking about it and just we were heading to, to pickleball courts. And later that night, it ever showed me your phone, and there were ads for pickleball rackets and balls and, and all that because somebody was listening in on our conversation. She's like, this is a little creepy. I said, no, it's a lot creepy. Welcome to the modern age. But in our jobs, we have performance reviews, right? How are we doing? Are we meeting our, our quotas? Are we meeting our, um, our deliverables? And so it's always about improving and getting better. Sometimes for the better, but sometimes at the expense of our calmness and enjoyment of the present. And generally, it's always about keeping up with the Joneses about what they have. And I know we have some Joneses here, so I'll change that. About keeping up with the Kardashians. How's that? And so, what do they have? What clothes are they wearing? What makeup are they wearing? What is their internet presence? How can I have a better car? How can I have the best phone? What's the best gadget I can get? How can I make my life more convenient? How can I have a bigger house? I know we have a two-car garage, but what if we had a three-car garage, right? We can never be content with what we have. It's always more, more, more. <coughs> but Paul says in verse 12, I know how to be brought low, I know how to abound, and in every other circumstance, I have learned the secret <coughs> of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. So, how do we have con uh, contentment? You take a pill and then you figure it out. Just kidding. That's not how it works. That's what we want, though. Instant gratification. Well, Paul says, how did he get by contentment? He learned it. This is about life ex our life experiences. <clears throat> our life experiences are important. Oftentimes today, I want my kids not to have any pain or suffering, and I do my best to not be a helicopter parent, or what's that borderline of being a helicopter parent, where I want to do everything I can to make their life as easy as possible, so they don't have to experience discomfort, right? But, it's in those failures, it's in those bad experiences, that they can learn how to be content in those circumstances. When I was a kid, right, this is a cue for old person alert. When I was a kid, and we'd go to Grandma and Grandpa's house, and we were in Southern Illinois, and we'd have to drive two hours, my entertainment was looking out the window and playing games like the alphabet game, finding letters in different spots on the highway. I didn't have a phone to watch movies or TVs or play games. And that helped me learn contentment in those moments. When our kids are in the sanctuary, sometimes they have to listen to an older person babble for 30-ish minutes. It's helping them learn to find contentment and peace even in these times. And they're doing great, by the way. But it's in those difficult circumstances that it helps us to learn to be content in the good times and the bad, in the feasts and the famine. Or as we say in weddings, in hunger, or in, uh, what is it, hunger and in, uh, in, I can't even remember now, there you go, sickness and health, rich or poor, all those things, yada, yada, yada. I don't have my notes in front of me. But in all those circumstances, we can find contentment. And so if you're struggling with peace, if you're struggling with anxiety, we can learn to, to rest in Jesus. That's part of our sanctification, to be content in all circumstances. And Paul's saying it is possible. Because in 13, he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now I get that is in almost every uh, post-game press conference there is, especially in the playoffs or in any championship game, right? And oftentimes, for a pastor, it, 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 it makes me wince a little bit because it's always used out of context. Because generally, and I don't know if you guys remember this growing up, some of us will. We had a, there was a thing that was on uh, 
the local religious broadcast called the Power Team. Now these were folks, um, at least in Southern Illinois, that were that were bodybuilders, think wrestlers, like Hulk Hogan type bodies, right? Those big guys. And they would always say this first, and they would do all these crazy um, strength things. So they would take a, a, a phone book. Kids, I know you don't know what a phone book is, but they used to have every phone number in it. <coughs> I'm really showing my age today. Um, and so we have a phone book that had everybody's phone number, everybody's phone number in it. We can't, we probably couldn't do it today, but it had everybody's phone number in it, and they would take like somebody like St. Louis's phone book that was like ginormous, and they would rip it in half. It was like, oh, I can do all things that Christ who strengthens me. They would take a water bottle, and they would blow it up, and they would make it explode. I, I kid you not, you can, you, you can YouTube it, it's crazy. But it was all in the sense that they could do anything through Christ who strengthens them. All these crazy feats. They would break baseball bats, it was crazy. But as a kid who loved wrestling, it was great. It was like all these crazy things plus Jesus, what could be better? And so, but, what the athlete that does these things needs to understand is both sides are going to say it. It's not that one team loves Jesus more and that's why God lets them win. But they need to be content whether they win or lose. They are not defined if they're a winner or loser by this game. Right? And if they can say that, then they truly have contentment. That they can do all things in Christ who strengthens them. Because it's not whether they make it from AAA to the majors. It doesn't matter. Because they are content whatever God has for them. And so that's what we need to understand, is that God has called us all in a vocation. Everyone here has a vocation. Now, I'm using the correct, correct verb tense. It's not has been or had, but it's have a vocation. That God is calling each of us to use our gifts and abilities for Jesus. That we glorify him in all we do. So whether we're a kiddo going to school and loving our parents and our grandparents and sharing the joy of being a kid in innocence, that is part of their vocation right now. God is preparing those kids one day to grow up and to do something extraordinary in this world, whether that's a first responder, whether that's a pharmacist, whether that's a major league baseball player or wrestler, who knows what that is, but all of those that God's preparing them to use their gifts and abilities for his glory. For those that are currently in the workforce, God has you there for a reason. I know your coworkers make you crazy. I know your bosses drive you crazy, but you're there for a reason. And there are those that are here that are retired. And yes, you're retired from your jobs, but you're not retired from the service of the Lord. That's why it's important that, that y'all are working using y'all, you all, for BBS, making bags for BBS, making blankets for BBS, making snacks, doing games, being here, being here is important, seeing your love for the Lord is important for kids to see, through our vocations, and being happy with where God has us at the moment is important. Even though we're working on getting that promotion, even though we are working on finding that new job, that God is calling us to say, it's going to be okay, I have you, wait for me. And I know we're like, God, come on, we need to move on here, but take a breath and wait on the Lord. He is working something in you and those around you for his glory. Verse 14. It was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with, with me, giving and receiving, except only you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, and the fragrant offering, and the sacrifice acceptable and pleasing God. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory, Christ Jesus, to God the Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. I've already talked about this, but the important thing I want you to hear in this is that it is to your credit. Paul's not saying this is my credit that he's doing his ministry missionary work. In verse 17, he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. 
as you support your pastor, as you support missionaries, as you help those around you in need, as you are generous with what God has given you, it is to your credit on how you are helping that ministry go forward. So, in the tapestry that God has created in life, as God has brought up missionaries in this church, as he's had a number of pastors that you have supported, as you have sent missionaries out to Mexico and other places around the world, traces of Redeemer are all over the world and have impacted people you will never meet. And one day, in heaven, you'll bump and rub, rub shoulders with someone, and they say, oh, Redeemer Evangelical Church, and they'll be speaking Spanish. I don't know. I really don't know if they're going to speak in Spanish. We have a different language. We're all going to speak Hebrew. I don't know. But we'll understand them, speaking in tongues. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And they'll say, oh, I knew Mike and Becky Kelker, and I hear you supported them. Well, I heard about Jesus because of your gift. Thank you. And that will be a beautiful moment that you had that you impacted somebody you never did because you were generous, because God was generous with us. So friends, life is hard. We are all around people that are doing their best to get through the day. Philippians is a great book to encourage people that it's going to be okay. That they can find peace, they can find rest, they can find contentment in the work that Jesus is doing in them and through them, that Jesus is working to restore all things. And that as we know, friends, that are going through this, as we experience peace, as we experience no anxiety, as we experience contentment in ourselves, people can look at us and say, how do you do it? Teach me how. And through our life experiences, as we have learned to be content in all situations, we can say, like Paul, I haven't perfected it, I haven't totally figured it out, but I'll do my best to, to teach you what I have learned, and how I can have peace and joy in all circumstances in my Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your peace, for your joy, for your contentment that only you can bring. Father, there are so many voices that we hear all over the place saying, you can do better, give us more, produce more. I know you're working 40 hours, but I really need 50 hours. I know you're working 50 hours, but I can really use 60 hours. We have this big project coming up. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be content with what we have, that even if we say no, and even if they say, well, we don't need your services anymore, Father, that we can find contentment for whatever you bring. Father, for those that are struggling to find peace, joy, and contentment, Father, I pray that you would help bring people into their lives to help them find joy, peace, and contentment. Father, that, that as we ask questions of ourselves about if we are content, where we find our hope, where we find our peace, Father, I pray that you would inject yourself into those thoughts, into those struggles, and to help us to see how you love us, how you have provided for us, and how you are continuing to meld us and mold us to be more like your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that you would help us to be content with what we have. That we would be content in what you have given us. Father, I pray that you would help us to take our anxiety and to give it to you, whatever we're going through. That we, would, that we know, that we know, that we know at the end of the day that you are working all things together for our good. And I pray that you would help us bring this joy, peace, and contentment with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask if you would stand for our last song. We're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. You're going to look at your hymnal at 602. We're just going to sing the first verse. Where the words will be on the screens. I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs>
person or whether you're at home, we're glad that you joined us today. We'd love to see you downstairs for some coffee and donuts. We still need aluminum cans. Yes. Pans. We also could use some two liter bottles. So drink some soda and bring in those empty bottles. Friends, our, uh, our benediction today is found in Romans chapter 15. It says this, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace of believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in grace, peace, joy, and contentment.